Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Warren Weekman. I'm from UC Irvine. And we're going to talk today about um, this project we put together over the past couple of years. It's called Evaluating the Affordances of the iPad for Standardized Patient Encounters During Clinical Skills Exams. Bit of a long title. What does it exactly mean? And so for us, this is really how do we get the iPad into a clinical care environment? How do we use that meaningfully for sort of a patient encounter? So a little bit of a backstory here to talk about what we've done at our institution kind of moving forward. So UC Irvine, we are the ant eaters. That's sort of our mascot. So we have um, you know, a big ant eater that kind of goes around to describe what we do. So with our curriculum up till about 2010, very traditional paper notes, textbooks. Um, in 2010, we had sort of a big shift within our institution, and we had introduced iPads into creating a sort of a digital curriculum for our students where all the notes all the textbooks went onto a singular device, and our students had access to all this great information. So the great part about all this for our students was we sort of learned after a period of time that you know, with medical students and iPads, they were actually learning better. They were doing better on their exams, and even on national exams, they were actually doing a lot better for scores. But the big question came, well, that's great, um, but do, you, you know, do better scores really mean anything? Do better scores really equal better doctors? And that's sort of the big question that we always have when we look at metrics within a medical school. And so it got us thinking a little bit more, well, we know the iPad's been great for students in the classroom setting. What can we do with the iPad or any sort of tablet or mobile device in a clinical care environment? And we weren't really looking specifically just at what the iPad could do as far as pulling up information at the bedside. We wanted to look at how we could use this as a device for the same way that our students are engaging with the material more and learning more how can we do that with having our students engage more with the patients? And so for us, that was a big challenge that we had with our curriculum and how to really put this together into um, a better program. So what we looked at is we sort of had four ideas. We thought we'd, we want to get iPads in the students' hands and have them work with our patients. But it's kind of hard to do that really in a live patient environment. So what we did is we opted to go to um, a simulated environment with our clinical skills center and standardized patients. We looked at four sort of metrics of what we wanted to really figure out about how to make this technology work. So we wanted to know with, whether the iPad could be an effective tool to facilitate student encounters with patients. We also wanted to know could presentations, multimedia, all the stuff that makes tablets great, sort of this depth of knowledge, this interactive content, could that actually improve the patient experience, the patient encounter itself? Um, and then how did students feel about using this? We're sort of throwing them uh, a twist here on the traditional sort of patient-physician interaction. How are they going to be able to cope with these changes? And then more importantly, um, not just how they feel about it, but actually technically, how good are they at doing this? So these are kind of the four things that we wanted to address and answer. And so as I sort of alluded to before, we put this into a simulated environment. So most medical schools have a training environment called a clinical skill center or something along those lines that has patient actors. For those of you that are Seinfeld fans, this is what Kramer did where he acted that he was cirrhotic and talked about his, his love of booze. But we, we use this sort of model to have a nice controlled way to really safely look at how our students are working with patients. And so in this sort of picture, you can see that in the, on sort of the right side of the screen there, there's a student and a standardized patient and there's sort of an observer booth on the backside, and all these encounters are recorded, and there's great ways to look at all this sort of depth of data that happens when students are interacting with these simulated patients. And so what we did was we put this into three of our clerkships, and three of our clinical rotations, where our students had opportunities to work in these simulated patient care environments. So we chose family medicine, surgery, and pediatrics. And um, they were evaluated across a couple different metrics, but what it came down to is we said, all right, you have all these different patient encounters. What we're gonna ask you to do is this is a patient that's coming back for a follow-up visit. We want you to use this iPad, your iPad, and have a teachable moment. Go through with your patient, talk about their disease condition, talk about the surgery they just had. Use the tools that you have on your device to teach the patient and engage with them and spend that extra few minutes just talking about how well you can teach and sort of transfer your knowledge from yourself to that patient. And so they were evaluated by, by the patients themselves, evaluated them, they did sort of a self-assessment, and then we had a team of students that went back after and watched all the videos and tried to pull out these important metrics. So what we had them actually use was an app called DrawMD. And uh, this is sort of a quick demonstration of how the app works. It has a lot of great templates, and for this example, um, what we sort of describe is a patient needs uh, vascular access, they don't have a good IV, and so here's where the heart sits, and here are the large blood vessels that we need to access. And so we're going to put a large catheter in the upper part of the chest. We're going to go through here, 
Uh, and it could be a dangerous procedure because there's a lot of important structures around it, such as the lungs. And if there was a problem, you could deflate a lung, and that would be a very bad thing. So something as very simple as that provides a little bit more commentary and depth to just a student trying to explain a procedure, uh, where oftentimes there isn't good visuals, or if they have a piece of paper, the visuals aren't really quite there. So the, the DRAMD app series has a large variety of content that our students have had access to that allows us to kind of look at different scenarios. We could craft the scenarios around what content is available for these students. Um, so this is what they would use, and the student and patient would have this extra opportunity to engage together. So when we talk about the standardized patient feedback, so we would ask the patients, you know, did the students create an effective environment? Um, where they could use this presentation using the app, and could they really sort of engage? Um, and the feedback was actually pretty impressive on our end, that without much instruction at all, other than these are the confines of what you can and can't do in the encounter, and with a very brief you know, 15, 30-minute overview of how the app works, our students did a pretty decent job of educating and using the tools in front of them to educate at the bedside, sort of on the fly. Um, we asked sort of a, another way to approach this, did, the students' work, what they do at the bedside, did actually have value to it? Did it improve the patient's understanding of the conditions um, using this app? And also had pretty good numbers there that made us feel pretty good about what we were doing. Um, and so what we started to look at then was sort of the other metrics of could this be replicable? Is this just a one-time occurrence? What can we actually do to make this work? So when we talked to the students, one of the things that that they have is they have a few minutes of prep time before they go in the room. Uh, as with any encounter, they have about five or ten different minutes. And they have this opportunity to go through and, uh, and we ask them, did that extra time with the app and kind of planning out your thoughts in your presentation, did that help you prep for the visit? Um, again, a pretty high agreeance there. And then did it allow them a better way to communicate with the patients? Um, oftentimes we heard anecdotal feedback that the students, they wouldn't know where to start, they wouldn't know how to kind of push the whole encounter along, and they just didn't really have a good construct for how to talk with a patient, which is kind of scary when you think about that. But short of having a, here's your diagnosis, do you have any questions, they didn't really have, know how to have a dialogue or discussion with a patient. And this was a problem that they had, and the, this sort of process helped them kind of come through a little bit together. We also looked at some of the, the, the myths or preconceptions that our students had, um, both from the student side and the administrator side that we looked at as well. Um, a lot of students felt that this was a terrible idea that the last thing we want to do as you're testing us for how good we can interact with the patients is give us more interaction. And give us more interaction in an environment where we're trying something completely new that's never been done before, no one even knows if it's useful, why are we guinea pigs? And so there's a lot of concern about this, and actually when we came down to it and asked the students after the fact, it wasn't too bad. So only a small percentage, about 17% um, of the entire third year class that went through this, this uh, experiment felt that it was a distraction, which was good. The other thought was, well, what happens if there's a problem? You know, there, it's going to throw off the flow, everyone's going to get nervous. If the iPad crashes or the app crashes, it's really going to throw off the whole experience, and I just don't want to do it. So um, with that kind of concern, there's only a small percent that felt after their experience, both from the patient and the student side, was there a technical problem that really got in the way of the encounter. So really low barrier to entry, um, very little in the way of problems happening right there. The other big thing is, well, now you know, we're trying to encourage our students to have a good demeanor with our patients, to make eye contact, to kind of engage with them, and now you're going to throw a tablet right in the middle. It's just going to ruin all that work we've done. They're going to be terrible. And our students actually did really good. You know, our students maintained eye contact. We're sort of very cautious about how to use it and how to make it a part of the presentation and part of that interaction. Um, that being said, though, you know, this is all self-reporting data and very subjective data from both our students and the standardized patients. The money kind of came down to when we actually looked at the videos. And so we pulled together a team of students to actually go through and watch the videos from start to finish and really start making observations about what worked and what didn't work and started to try and make a comprehensive list of those things. Now, for reference of, of how to actually use a tablet or device in a patient encounter, we use this thing called our, our mobile etiquette checklist and the, the links up there. And this is something that we put together at UCI that was sort of a, a culmination or a curation of best practices that we found from both the EMR literature. Um, there's, there's some literature from the uh, Permanente Foundation in 2004 that talks about this acronym LEVEL 
for how to engage with the EMR at the bedside. And we use some of those, those pieces as well as just other anecdotal stories from patients and students and providers as well as far as how do they use technology at the bedside. And so what this checklist looks like is sort of breaking up the encounter into three different areas, the, the preparation, the presentation, and sort of the, the debrief or conclusion. And I know it's kind of hard to read up here as, as a whole for the audience, but some of the main questions that we talked about that we asked the students specifically as they're watching through the videos, um, we were sort of grading them on. And some of the, the more interesting metrics that we wanted to highlight are the following, that um, did the students introduce the iPad and its purpose? The large majority said yes. So it's kind of nice that they framed the discussion that today we're going to use an iPad to talk about your, your visit. And if something as very simple as that, it sort of sets up the expectations for what's going to happen in the visit. And a large number of students were actually able to do that without prompting. The part that's kind of interesting is that um, we do have patients that prefer not to have technology at the bedside. Um, it's not a lot, but some of them prefer just to have a meaningful discussion. They don't want other pieces in there. And the large majority of students didn't ask if it was okay to bring a device into the equation. We don't often see this as much in the clinical scenarios. We often see this at the bedside clinically where a student will pull up a reference on their phone or an iPad, or they'll inadvertently show a picture that is an operative photo that by their standards is not gory, but for patient standard, it's maybe not a sensible thing to do. And so they'll sort of expose a patient to um, kind of horrible images without asking them if it's okay to do so. And these are the things we want to have our students cognizant about, that before you sort of assume that they're equally as okay with medical content as you are, you need to ask. Something as simple as ask. It's not going to take a lot of time, but you still need to ask and sort of engage in that process. The other thing we found out is that um, from a lot of the literature with the EMR, that just having a screen up all the time can be a distraction, both for you as a provider and for the patient. And so little things to sort of maintain that student-physician relationship of closing the screen or turning off the screen when the encounter was done, did students do that? And again, without prompting, a lot of students didn't do this. And so these are things that without a lot of training, our students who feel, we got this, we know how iPads work, we know how tablets work, we could probably use this in the clinic, there's still a lot of areas where there's deficiencies. And that's one of the things we wanted to highlight that as good as they are with technology, they're not very good at the technology as a physician yet. And so these are the things that we're trying to approach. Um, so some of the other things we found out too, that as you're going through this, that you know, for teaching or using a device or showing a video, sort of the ideal time is about three to six minutes, about five minutes is the sweet spot right there. Um, any more than that, the students sort of get lost in what they're trying to do. They get sort of a little bit perfectionist. Uh, students are typically sort of the type A, almost OCD in trying to make a great diagram, and that can really disengage the patient. So sort of the ideal time has been that three to five minutes. Um, and that's sort of where it becomes a natural discussion. It doesn't seem forced. It doesn't seem like I'm trying to put the technology in here for a purpose. It's sort of an adjunct and not a dominating part of what you're doing. So sort of the other pieces that we found out there. What was interesting, though, is that without, again, a lot of prompting, we wanted to see what naturally happened in the student environment. They sort of gravitated to two sort of natural positions of how to share this content. One of the big fears that we've always been told from our administration and sort of the senior physicians is that tablets at the bedside or any computer at the bedside is going to mean that someone's back is to the patient, there's going to be typing, uh, there's not going to be that direct eye contact or engagement, but our students preferentially went to these sort of two almost diagrams, the, the meet in the middle where the iPad was in the middle, the student would do the diagrams upside down so the patient could see, or sort of the butterfly where they sort of gather around and hover around uh, the content to be able to share it that way. And it's sort of, it's sort of neat that while they're not good at the teaching part, just sort of de novo, they're still really good at trying to engage with one another, which was promising. So when it comes down to it, these are the four things we're trying to look at. And a lot of this is, is true to some degree that, yes, it can be an effective tool. And this is still very preliminary research, but it, it got us thinking, well, what more can we do with the technology? Should education be a very big part of the student experience? And we feel very strongly that it should be, that you know, we are students, but we're also educators as well, that every student, every physician should be an educator. And if they have an opportunity to educate a patient, one, that means they're gonna spend more time at the bedside focusing on making that interaction and that engagement. And for us, it's a very important thing that we wanna do. So when we talk about next steps, the problem with a lot of this research is that there's not a 
a large volume of it out there. There's a lot of good research on the EMRs. There's still a lot of limited research on tablets and mobile devices and engagement. And so we're trying to develop a more standardized way to evaluate these encounters, develop a way to replicate it so that other schools could try this, other programs, other sort of specialties, nursing, uh, PA schools could sort of pick this up and try and use this as a method or a model for engagement. Uh, and then most importantly, this kind of goes back to the, the panel we sort of sat on, but this is a, a way for us to teach students to, to better leverage the technology, um, to better engage and hopefully educate patients. So with that, I'll, I'd love to entertain any questions, if there's any questions. Great. Oh, uh, yeah. Talk very uh, briefly about the um, use of textbooks by medical students on iPads. Sure. If you're willing to discuss that. Yeah. It's, um, it's a variable thing nowadays. Now that there's a lot of great digital resources out there, uh, we found that our students are doing their own content curation a lot of the times. The, the sort of the old days as educators where we say, this is my textbook of choice, you should really read this. Um, now that there's so many different varieties of formats from print to text to interactive text with quizzes built into it to uh, diagrams to YouTube, it's really hard to pick the one best resource. And the times that we do choose a one best resource for our students, after kind of four years of our iPad curriculum, we're only right about 20% of the time. So the students tend to find what works best for them. And I think that's one of the strengths of having sort of a platform like this, any sort of tablet platform, is that they can find the tools that mean the most to them as students, as learners. Hi, I wanted to hear more about the engaged side of this. Um, teaching the yeah. med students that they should be an educator, they could bring with them a one-way education, whereas an educator learns from their students, right. who then is the patient. Right. And for us, it's, it's, it's a really big point. I mean, you, you bring up a really great point about this. Um, in many of these environments, education is not even discussed. You sort of teach the patient, you tell them what's wrong, and the focus is primarily on the student to find the facts and be a good physician. There's never really that focus, still I think in a large place, is on the education. I think the engagement piece is sort of that next step for us. Instead of just saying, well now that I've taught you, that can still be very one way, as you said. So picking up the cues of how to engage better, how to empathize, how to be an active listener, and sort of feedback that information is very important. We just started a pilot using Google Glass, actually, where Glass goes on our standardized patients and is recording our students. So we can actually see if they're active listeners. So for the first time, students can see themselves through the patient's eyes. And they sit back and watch that video. It's like the first time when you're presenting, you, you see a video of yourself giving a talk, and you're like, wow, I'm really a pacer, or I really, my hands just move like this. When a student sees that for the first time, like I roll my eyes every time I, I hear a patient talk, like those sort of weird quirks that you sometimes see with physicians, we're trying to phase those out a little bit. But it's, it's that other piece of it, because students don't have this awareness. They're not really trained to have this awareness, and so we're trying to start as early as possible of sort of putting it on the, on the, on the radar for them. I actually have a question. Yeah. Um, so I'm really interested in uh, medical education, and teaching millennials is super important right. to me, and the idea that as educators we don't have the same experience as the people we're educating in terms of access to information. Right. Did you notice, I know, I know in medical school there's all different ranges of right. ages, did you notice a difference in comfort level between the people who were a little bit older in medical school versus the people who were sort of right in your target age? Right. Um, we didn't notice as much. We, we, we have, a, it seems like, a smaller age range within our school, but uh, it felt like at times that there were students that were opposed to it, not because of it, the technical aspect. They just didn't get why this was important. Um, and I think that's, again, part of a problem that I think stems from us not teaching them the proper context for it. Because um, we have physicians, like faculty, when we do faculty development stuff, that love doing this. And for them, it's, it's a great way to spend more time at the bedside. When, when we have physicians that actually do this, for them, they say, it, it forces me to spend an extra five minutes at the bedside that I normally wouldn't do on my own, but now that I'm there, I have more time at the bedside. And if this is just a simple little trick to get physicians back to the bedside for even five minutes longer, I think that's a, a, an incremental step, not the best answer, but at least an incremental step in the right direction. Interesting. Cool. Yes. Um, this might be a question for your uh, Google Glass study, but... Uh, Aside from just distraction, I'm wondering if the iPad changes the conversation. Mm -hmm. So if instead of having a more open conversation where maybe a patient could 
drive what they want to talk about, or maybe they're more afraid of complications as opposed to the procedure itself. Um, I'm wondering if having the iPad and having the diagrams there would change the content of what gets discussed. Right. And I don't really have a good answer for that, but you're right. I think one of the things that is nice that we sort of limit in those OSCEs is we don't allow them to sort of take the tangents that would probably naturally happen in these sort of discussions. Um, when students are doing it actually in the clinical environment, which they're encouraged to do, oftentimes the, the quick stop in becomes a five or 10 minute encounter because they can take those tangents. You know, the patient's concerned about the cosmetics of a surgery and they can look at scar formation, et cetera, and they can do those natural leaps. And I think the student feels a little bit more comfortable in making those sort of leaps because they're just, they're more nimble with the technology. And at that point, they have a little bit more learning underneath them where they feel comfortable taking those tangents with kind of the references behind them. Thank you so much, Dr. Wickman. Great.